Good morning, good morning to burners one and all and burners soon to be. I'm glad you're not afraid of a little rain or even a hurricane. I'm delighted that you're here with us at the Smithsonian American Art Museum. After all, we have indoor plumbing, uh, something to recommend uh, to all of you. Uh, I have the pleasure of being the Margaret and Terry Stent director here. I'm Stephanie Siebisch, and I too am a proud burner. I want to share, oh, thank you. I want to acknowledge uh, someone I admire deeply, uh, who is one of my fabulous commissioners, Fleur Bressler, who's 92 years young, maybe the oldest burner, certainly on the playa this year. She brought gener two generations of her family with her. That may be the new Burning Man experience, the intergenerational family. Thank you, Fleur. Uh, here at the Smithsonian American Art Museum, you know, of course, that our branch museum is the Renwick Gallery, dedicated to American crafts. And we are focused on celebrating American artists, uh, their creativity, and uh, their work that reflects what we call the American experience as well as global connections. And I'm sure you agree that Burning Man is a uniquely American experience. I thought I'd share with you briefly something that I learned, one of the many things I learned on Playa. I was at center camp, and it was one of those extremely hot moments, so I thought I'd rest a little bit and uh, hear from so many interesting people who had a moment to share their thinking and their expertise. And on this occasion, it was a panel of artists who were reflecting on their experience of being creators, of preparing and planning works for Burning Man. And, and three things were stressed, and, and it's something that I've shared as, a, as I've had the pleasure of giving many a tour through our fabulous exhibition, No Spectators, The Art of Burning Man. And last I checked, it's uh, hitting 530,000 visitors to date. And, uh, and counting. So three things were emphasized that makes Burning Man and the art that's created there so very special. I'm sure these won't surprise you, but it's nice to have it wrapped up together. One, the scale at which you can work there is beyond anything that we can offer in our humble museum buildings or even in public spaces. There's this sort of um, open sky, there's this incredible feeling. And so you see that in those 55-foot uh, pieces by Marco Cochran, or uh, I love the um, fabulous tree of Tenera. I mean, the kind of scale and complexity that you can achieve. And that also is uh, related to the, the second point, is the interactive quality of the pieces that are uh, created. Um, they're kinetic, they are meant to be swung on, climbed on, uh, there's often a sound element, uh, and, and they light up. Uh, uh, they're illuminated, certainly at night. We, we need that very much there. And so it's a, a kind of involvement uh, of, of, the, of the viewer, of the participant, uh, that is very special, and I think that's part of the joy uh, of these works, is their interactive uh, qualities. And the third element, again, no surprise, is these works are complicated enough, ambitious enough, that it's really not the undertaking of the single artist. It's really a community. It's a people of different skills and, and backgrounds creating a collective or a consortium create these works. And, and again, that, that is, in the museum field, things that we've been thinking about in terms of what these artworks bring to us that we don't necessarily offer in other ways. I'd also tell you what my biggest worry was in terms of uh, having the responsibility as director with uh, the No Spectators, the Art of Burning Man exhibition. And so I would tell you the danger was not um, not the complexity of show, not the <laughs> new ground we were breaking and the, the special permissions we had to ask at the Smithsonian to pull it off. It wasn't the cost, which was considerable at over $1.3 million. It wasn't the number of artists, we, we, we can handle that. It was really the biggest danger, the bi biggest risk was not capturing the spirit of Burning Man because we knew we had a lot of people watching closely. 
with high expectations and a deep love and passion for it. And so I'm particularly grateful uh, that we have a moment to come together to hear from some of the key founders and artists and a chance for us to even post uh, Burning Man this year to come together and, uh, and remember and also put it in a, in a bit of a scholarly context here at the museum. I'm also the chief gratitude officer at the museum and uh, in that spirit, <laughs> uh, we have a wonderful, we have a wonderful organization called the Smithsonian's Women's Committee. They were ready to jump on the opportunity to fund our program today. And of course, I, uh, I, oh, I like to begin and end with thanking the curator who really conceives of these kinds of bold ideas and that would be Nora Atkinson who, uh, who really uh, was so passionate about it and shared her enthusiasm when we had no idea what we were getting into <laughs> in the early planning days. And uh, I like to say that my predecessor greenlighted the project. It was on the calendar when I arrived a year and a half ago. So she left me with the pleasure of going to Burning Man <laughs> and also raising the funds. And when I came back, <laughs> when I came back, I said to Nora, we really have to do this well. The, the budget can go up. We, we, um, we're not... Uh, cutting back on, on artist fees or, or some of the key things to make it really uh, sing. We, we have to do this very, very well. I, I'm so indebted to the wonderful people that are connected with and lead the Burning Man organization. The folks that I have learned so much about, I have incredible respect, and it begins with Kim Cook and Maureen Goodell, Megan Miller, and also James Mayagotia, and I really thank them from the bottom of my heart for all they've done, and, and particularly with this symposium. So please join me. And you know, the, once you're a burner, the, the journey's never over. I mean, for us, even those folks who have not been to Burning Man on my staff, we, we um, are so invested in this project beyond uh, when we know, sadly, it has to, it has to come down. I also want to uh, encourage you to spend some time here in the building. This is uh, the home of American creativity and ingenuity. It was the old patent office where the earliest days of this city, it was the third federal building constructed after the White House and Congress. This building, two city blocks long, to house American innovation. And, and so it's, I think, a very fitting and a good match. Smithsonian, free to all, open 364 days a year. And the Renwick, also another temple of creativity and the, and the first purpose-built uh, museum in Washington, D.C. So anyway, you really want to hear from each other. There's a great program ahead, so I also want to uh, thank the terrific organizing staff here, Sona Shaw and Gloria Kenyon, who've helped put this together today. So thank you one and all for being here. So yes, uh, hi everybody, my name's Nora Atkinson. I'm the Lloyd Herman Curator of Craft of the Renwick Gallery, a branch museum of the fabulous museum that you're in right now, the Smithsonian American Art Museum. And I do wanna thank Stephanie for backing this project because you never know what you're gonna get when you have a brand new uh, director in place. And uh, this is a tough one um, coming in to raise over a million dollars to make something like this happen. So it's been really incredible to have her support and to work with the Burning Man community. Um, I am just back from Playa for the second time now. I was not a burner when I started this project, amazingly. Um, but uh, yes, so <laughs> now, now I'm stuck with you all for the foreseeable future. So um, probably like a lot of you, I am uh, still getting the dust out. So I want to thank you all for coming this morning. Uh, we were just discussing the fact that perhaps this was not the best idea to plan just after Burning Man. But we really wanted to celebrate the end of, uh, of the first floor uh, before it closed and have everybody have the opportunity um, to go see that. So thanks for braving the weather. Thanks for coming out here. Even though you're all still tired and exhausted and dusty, um, bravo to you for being here this early in the morning. I think we'll get more people filtering in a little bit later. Um, I think by all accounts, this has been a really pivotal year for Burning Man. Uh, it's 
this mounting of the, this major national exhibition obviously has um, has raised a big profile for Burning Man that it already had um, from a few other venues that have recently done exhibitions, uh, the Nevada Museum of Art, the Hermitage Museum, Fuller Craft did a jewelry exhibition and whatnot. So it's really um, raising it to a new level of public consciousness in this country. Um, and sadly, also the unexpected passing of Burning Man's original founder, Larry Harvey, um, who passed away just a few weeks after our opening here. And we were incredibly fortunate to have him here to see this moment in his legacy. Um, so although we could have gone a lot of ways with this symposium, given that kind of context, um, and I'm, I mean, I'm sure that we could have done a symposium that lasted a week and we would only be hitting the tip of the iceberg with all of this. Uh, but we thought that we'd like to take stock of this amazing thing that Larry started in 1986 with just a few people in San Francisco's Baker Beach that has grown to 70,000 people in a city in a desert and now a whole global movement. So we are thrilled today to have with us all five surviving founders of Burning Man. It's a very unusual event to have them all in one place. Um, and also a few of our favorite artists and burners to talk about the Burning Man that was and the Burning Man that will be. Um, now, although today we are largely focusing on that bigger picture, I al also want to acknowledge the stories of the whole Burning Man community that make it such a rich experience. Um, so I'm wondering how many makers do I have in my audience here? Okay. And how many people here have been to Burning Man? How many of you are actual burners? So um, with all of these people in this room looking around at your neighbors, um, every single one of these people has amazing stories that they probably want to share with you. So I encourage you, radical participation, talk to your neighbor, um, go out to lunch. Um, you know, this is an incredible wealth of knowledge and a lot of entertainment in this room. And as Stephanie mentioned, I would like to point out our fabulous commissioner for Fleur Bressler, who had her virgin burn at 92 years old, celebrated her birthday on Playa. So if you want somebody to tell you fabulous stories, <laughs> Fleur is your person. Also, um, I know Nicholas King. Is Nicholas here yet? There's Nicholas, yes. Um, Nicholas King, uh, part of the exhibition, has photographs in the gallery that we have about the people of Burning Man, um, has the fabulous book Burners that he created, and he's here, so interact with him as well, because I wish we could have all of our makers up here on the stage, but you'll have to have those heartfelt interactive conversations with people instead, goodness, God forbid. Um, so I think it's going to be a highly educational and and entertaining day, um, and as many of us come back from the desert, I think this is a nice way to decompress. And so with that, I think we should start the program. Uh, so I'd first like to welcome Crimson Rose. Crimson is Burning Man's original fire art dancer, the protectress of the man, and she's been involved in Burning Man since 1991. Crimson led the development of the organization's art department, which grants more than $1.4 million to artists annually. She's a founding board member of the Black Rock Arts Foundation. She currently serves as secretary to the Burning Man Project Board of Directors, and she's a passionate advocate and ambassador for Burning Man and its principles. Please come up to the stage, Crimson. Fire is the very heart and essence of all life, for it is more phenomena than substance that is revealed, seen, and touched in ways of ritual and risk.
goodness, I can't see the... If I could have a little light. <laughs> if I could have a little light, please. Thank you. <laughs> It is the primordial energy of the divine manifesting in matter, and we are all part of that primordial ingredient. Dancing with fire is a ritual for me. I love it. It keeps me on the edge. It is giving thanks to the fire that reaffirms and strengthens belief in myself. In turn, the fire transforms me as a vehicle to transmute energy, provoking me to literally touch the flame. Fire burns in each and every one of us. We are all united by fire, in our spirit, in our blood, and in our hearts. Fire is what gives us life. But it is up to us, our intention, of what we do with that fire, with the blaze that burns inside of us. Sometimes a simple spark will ignite a dance. Others will create art and release it by fire. If we repeat something long enough, it becomes second nature to us a tradition, a ceremony, a ritual, and even magic. We are deep wells of light when we are true and open to our own sacredness. We are drawn to the fire, to stand as close as humanly possible to the heat, to the danger. We warm not only our spiritual being, but our spiritual self. Fire beckons to be released. It yearns to come alive. Fire ritual is not new to those that are drawn to the flame. It is our inner light, as well as a living symbol of the divine fire that burns in every soul. Whether we light candles, dance among the flames, hold fire in our hands, setting church trap on fire, creating a costume of pyrotechnics and lighting yourself on fire, and blowing plumes of red hot heat. The fascination with fire is its veritability and unpredictability, which I truly love. As in The Serpent Mother by the Flaming Lotus Girls, a 168 foot long serpentine sculpture whose head rises 20 feet in the air, opening and closing a jaw of jagged teeth and breathing fire. And it coils down, spiral around its steel egg, creating an interactive environment. Most of its 50 vertebrae are propane-fueled flame effects. Everyone is invited to play, creating bursts of rhythmic flames. The action of participants by simply pushing a button brings the art alive. From a spiritual perspective, a fire represents our passions, compulsions, zeal, creativity, and motivation. The element of fire has great power for forging will and determination, just like us. So how would any of us know the hidden fire of our spiritual self was waiting for us in the Black Rock Desert? the largest flat expanse in North America, 400 square miles of a prehistoric dry lake bed. But why would a place that seems to be barren and desolate hold so much potential? Why would anyone go to the middle of what appears to be nowhere? 
Well, quoting Annie Bredock, she says, there is a common belief among anthropologists that you must immerse yourself in an unfamiliar world in order to truly understand your own. The environment of the Black Rock Desert is very harsh to us soft humans who have no lizard skin to protect from the sun, no lizard eyelids to keep out the dust. Nature is the highest authority on the Black Rock Desert. It either breaks you or you break through the barriers. And remember, the ovum must be cracked to create new life. And there is no room for ego. Actually, we burn up our ego. This environment, once an unfamiliar world to many of us, has become home. This place has the power to evoke passion and desire, just like fire, to inspire vitality, curiosity, just like fire. As each of us return year after year, we bring our own energy, our spirit, our childlike enthusiasm to Black Rock City, which adds to the effervescence of our culture. So how does one set the intention for culture to survive? It starts with a single point. Oops, oops, sorry. A single point, an idea. Whether it is putting pencil to paper or cracking the surface of the playa. What began as a starting point for survey of Black Rock City uh, became a ceremony that was created by Will Roger and Coyote called the Golden Spike for the Department of Public Works. Over the years, this gesture of appreciation shows those in attendance who take a swing at the spike that the rewarding hard work ahead of them will bear creative inspiration. The man will stay in that position, that starting point, and that is where the survey will radiate outward, creating a framework for creativity to blossom. Over the years, the shape of the man has changed very little. But the platforms of the pavilions that the man stands on or surrounds him have changed to re reflect the yearly themes like evolution, cargo cult, radical ritual, and this year was iRobot. The themes provide an access point to engage with yourself and with the community. We lovingly create this wooden figure we call the man. And quoting Larry Harvey, he says, it is a blank canvas onto which to project your own thoughts and feelings, a ritual outside of context and unfettered by explanation. So Burning Man was already alive with fire when I arrived in 1991. And my first statement of radical self-expression was to put on my 16-foot silk wings and climb the man, the same wings that are at the exhibit at the Renwick. This was my way to express my radical self. From that moment on, I felt as if I was the protectress of the man. If we were going to release the man by fire, then we needed to do it with intention. But it is not just about striking a match. It is about preparing the intention of giving thanks for the magic to happen. Each year of Burning Man, my, start, my week starts with my own personal ritual dedicated to the man. Utilizing a magnifying glass and focusing the sun's rays, I extract heat from the sun to light a fire in El Diablo, a cauldron in uh, our downtown civic center. This same fire will burn all week as long as we continue to stoke it, disturb it, and keep it alive so that it can be consumed for Saturday night's festivities. Sacred ritual is as ancient as humanity. Our rituals have become second nature to us. Our spiritual needs 
desired ceremony. A subconscious dream was driving us of ceremonies a long time ago. We may not have even known what we were creating consciously when we designated the first sacred space or what drew us to Black Rock City or lit the first ceremonial fire, but we were drawn to it. The procession of the ceremony of flame starts when I transfer the fire from El Diablo into the Lumiferis, which is carried by the lamplighters and processed by the Illuminists to the great circle that surrounds the man. As the processional circumnavigates the great circle, the flame will be accepted by each group of the fire conclave, the largest convergence of fire performers and support staff. More fire dance energy is expressed and lit loose than anywhere else in the world at one time. They will dance a protective circle of fire in honor of the man. The man who all week stands as witness. He is the cauldron and in turn will become the vortex. He pulls in all the energy, the laughter, the tears from the temple, the angst, the ego, and like a phoenix, he burns all of it to be free, to let go. Circles of energy will radiate out from the man as he is released in pyrotechnic delight. <coughs> The immolation of the man marks the ending of the old year and the beginning of a new one. For me, it's my birthday, 4th of July, New Year's. We pour our energy into the man and then we let go. The simple act of releasing one's art by fire reminds us of the immediacy and the fleeting nature of existence. We release our ownership over the man over any art that we liberate by fire. But Burning Man at 32 years is young compared to other cultures that utilize fire. All over the world, people have been accustomed from time immemorial to utilize fire on certain days of the year, whether paying homage to one's gods or goddesses, purging evil with fire, or creating effigies and setting them on fire. There has been an intimate relationship between fire and ritual, where tradition is being passed down from generation to generation. And maybe the original idea has been lost or has evolved over the years. Transitions of this kind can be traced back on historical evidence to the Middle Ages and their analogy to customs observed in antiquity goes with strong internal evidence to prove that their origin sprung in a period long prior to the spread of Christianity. Beltane is a Celtic word, means fires of Bel. This is their Celtic deity. It is the angelicized name for the Gaelic May Day Festival. It marks the beginning of summer when rituals were performed to protect the cattle, the crops, and people. Special bonfires were kindled and their flames and the smoke and the ash were deemed to have protective powers. And the people would, would walk their cattle through fires and inhale the smoke. When the people of Tai Hang miraculously stopped a plague with a fire dragon dance in the 19th century, they inadvertently launched the Hong Kong Mid-Autumn Festival. Ang Lee Kali, also known as the Firefight of Katel, taking place in Durga Parameshwara Temple, situated in Mangalore, India. It is a ritual that has hundreds of devotees hurling burning palm fronds at each other in order to appease the Hindu god, goddess Durga. She is the goddess of war. And actually, I'd love to do this at Burning Man. <laughs> Wouldn't you all? <laughs> Afterwards, the participants walk to the nearby temple where the 
entered are sprayed with holy water. Up Helle A Fire Festival and Warwick, Scotland, a tradition that originated in the 1800s involving a series of marches, visitations, and culminating in a torch-lit procession where the Goozlers form a circle around the galley and in preparation for sending the galley to Valhalla. The most popular version says that Las Fias comes from a century-old tradition in which the city's carpenters would burn old materials they didn't need on the day before the day of St. Joseph, the patron saint of carpenters. This has grown to incorporate 400 neighborhoods in Valencia, Spain, organizing all year long with fundraisers, parties, dinners to create works of art. And it sounds like theme camps, 400 theme camps all over the city. Fireworks in the morning, mash kalata in the afternoon, which is a rhythmic fireworks, and pyrotechnics at night. Cooking paella in the street with the scent wafting. Neighborhoods parading in their finest costumes and bringing flowers to the Statue of the Virgin. All of this culminates on March 19th, where in the course of two hours, all artwork is released by fire. And the city is in a deed alive with fire. Any of these traditions, rituals, celebrations, are they any different than what we create and release? What is flowing through us in Black Rock City? Are we tapping into the lingering flicker of ancient celebrations? What does it mean to create a work of art and then let go? Release one's ownership of the creation and give it to the community. The temple became the art which was designed to receive something from participants. Until David Best created the first temple in 2000, we never realized how much we needed one. So Black Rock City is like any other city. We have medical services, cafe, airport, post office. There was a need for a temple. After 19 years, the temples still reflect the mad masquerade and joy of our community, which can appear as a stark contrast to the rest of our event. It is that contrast that helps to define the Burning Man community as anything but one-sided. From, on from writing a person's name on a block of wood, participatory expression has grown to add something directly onto the temple. A poem, a photograph, a story, memento, a shrine. The designs have changed from year to year, but the meaning remains the same a place to commune with the passage of spirit, a place where participants can commemorate, remember, bid farewell, celebrate, and above all, honor those whose life has moved them. But the temples have become more than just wood or a depository of memories. Each person who contributes becomes an integral part of the temple. This year I did something a little different. I, I posted for anybody who was not coming to the event, send me the name of somebody that, that has passed. The gesture of writing an additional 130 names on the temple means the temple belongs to everyone, even if you were not in Black Rock City. Sunday night of our event, we release the temple while thousands of participants sit in silence, quiet, and in reverence, where the sound of fire is almost the only thing you can hear. So, can geometry be spiritual? I think so. I, th I think about what happens when geometry is released by fire, the way fire will caress every curve, everywhere, all at once, consuming. 
the ruins for me are just the starting point. With the embers, we can construct new ideas, symbols of new beginnings. And like a phoenix rising out of the ashes, the desire to burn the old to make way for the new, the cycle of birth and rebirth, the opportunity to reinvent oneself anew each year. With any fire, as I watch the ember cast rise into the air, it is like prayers being sent out into the world. Where will they land to sprout new ideas? The heat of the fire will stay in your heart long after the embers have died. May your fire spirit soar. Thank you.